Hey Badminton community, we're so happy. It's been 365 days since the release of our first episode of the Badminton Podcast on the 22nd of September 2019. Thank you so much for your support, your love and sharing the podcast with so many different people across the world. We really do love bringing it to you and hope that you're enjoying it too. As a celebration, we're doing a giveaway. So as a lucky listener, you could win some really cool Volant wear gear, all free of course, and we'll post it out directly to you if you do win. All you need to do is go to Instagram and type in The Badminton Podcast, and there are a few little things you need to do, very easy things that will put you in the running to win this awesome gear that makes you look good on and off the court. So once again, thanks for supporting us for a whole year and make sure you do check out the post on Instagram. We hope to be sending the gear to you. Brought to you from Melbourne, Australia, this is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello, Badminton community, and welcome to another episode of the Badminton Podcast, proudly sponsored by Volant Wear. For those of you who haven't heard our voices before, my name is Henry. And my name is Jeff. And we're the co-founders of Volant Wear. I want you to take the listeners back to a time where you went and decided you wanted to buy some badminton clothing and you thought, oh, that stuff's unsightly. I can't wear that on and off the court. So at Volant Wear, we're different. Check us out at www.volantwear.com where you can buy some really great gear, t-shirt and shorts that you can wear on and off the court in style. You can also get some access to some really great resources as well on there. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can follow us at Volant Wear, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. We're really excited to be here for this next episode of the podcast. You know, Jeff and I really enjoy, you know, connecting and reconnecting with the badminton community um, as we actually talked about this just before this episode. So we're really grateful to be able to connect with the badminton community and we're really grateful to those of you who are listening to us today. So before we do get started, Jeff and I just want to thank everyone and just say that, you know, this podcast is something that we really do enjoy, but unfortunately we do fund it through our own full-time jobs as well. So we're asking for some help so that we can continue releasing some regular high quality episodes that so many of you already enjoy. So we've set up a Patreon account where you can pledge just a few dollars per month, which will help us out a lot. So we really appreciate any support that you've provided. For those of you who have signed up to our Patreon account, thank you so much. Um, And we look forward to continue providing you some really high quality episodes. And now I'll leave it to Jeff to introduce our special guest today. Thanks, Henry. So today with us, we have Bjorn Seguin. I think I stuffed that up. Um, No, close. (laughs) Bjorn started his badminton career in France at the age of nine, and he later moved to New Zealand with his parents and became one of the best men's singles players within that country within just a couple of years. But due to his dual nationality, he was French and American, he wasn't able to play for New Zealand. So instead, he represented the US while playing in the French National League. His achievements, there's many of them, but they do include winning the Argentina Open, Columbia International Series, New Caledonia Open, and he's also won multiple Pan Am Championships medals. His career high world ranking was 57. Sorry, 67. I gave you I gave you 10 extra ranking points. <laughs> now, since 2018, he has transitioned into full-time work at an international IT services company called Atos, where he leads communication and marketing projects. So Bjorn, it's been a long time since I've seen you, and we just want to say thanks so much for joining us on today's podcast. No problem at all. And I would like to to thank uh, you and Henry for the invite. I think it's uh, great what you guys are doing through your brand and through these podcasts. I'm not sure how you find the time to combine it with uh, full-time jobs, but I think it's great. So happy to support you on this. 
Thanks very much. So let's get right into it, Bjorn. Now, this is actually a question we just received, I think, a couple of hours ago. And we quite often get people messaging through Instagram or through Facebook or through email and saying, hey, can you talk about this topic? I've got this question. Can you ask one of your guests this? Because there's lots of information out there, but sometimes it's hard to find the correct information. So Bjorn, if you wouldn't mind helping, there's a young man named Naga from Indonesia, and he asked us about string tension. So his understanding was he sees a lot of people who put really high string tension in their rackets, but they they don't have any strength. And in the end, they always blame the racket. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about string tension and what someone listening could take from your experience as to what string tension they should have their racket strung at. All right. That's a, an interesting question. I, I didn't expect that one, <laughs> um, but I think it's uh, very personal. And, uh, and from my personal experience, I would say that it always takes a little bit of time to get used to some sort of tension. Normally, it coincides with the level you play at. So normally you get a higher and higher tension as you get better. Because basically to explain it, I mean, I'm not sure uh, uh, how much into the basics I should get into. But if you get a higher tension, uh, you get more precision. But if you would like, for example, if you're more at a beginner or a intermediate level, you wouldn't like to have a little bit less tension to get a bit more power uh, out of your clears or out of your smashes whereas a higher tension will give you a more crisp shot. So the and obviously why, when you're at a high level, you're looking more for precision and sharpness of shots. So to answer the question, I think that you need to do things gradually. I mean, if, uh, for example, uh, you've been playing at a uh, 25 pounds for the past few years, don't straight away move to, to 30 or 32 pounds of very high tension, but gradually, then you can also see personally what you like best. From my side, I liked, uh, so it's 14 kilos. I think it's about 30 or 32 pounds. Uh, that, that's the tension I liked. I know that some people like it a little bit more high string, uh, while some people a little bit less. So, you know, again, it's uh, it's all personal. Sure, sure. And I guess I want to add to that from my opinion as well. And in that when you do string your the tension quite high, it's a little bit less forgiving. So when you don't hit the shuttle properly, you can either break the string very easily, which is going to send your, your stringing bill up very high. And it's also, if you don't hit it in the middle or in the sweet spot, you tend to have less control over the shot. But I feel that a looser string, while it does give you a bit more power, it also gives you a little bit more of a sweet spot and it's a little bit more forgiving on the racket itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And another factor is also the thickness of the string uh, that you need to, to consider it. I mean, obviously, if you have a less thick string, uh, such as a 0.66 millimeters, then if you're going to have a high tension, it is going to be um, broken a little bit faster compared to a, a thicker string at 0.7 millimeters, where there you can uh, go a little bit higher on the tension. Yeah, I think that's a really good point you bring up there because I feel that if you go the same tension with a thinner string, then it feels so much tighter than if you use, say, a thicker string at the same tension. It, it, it's a completely different feeling. So another thing to consider is definitely the thickness of your string. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with both of you as well. The last thing I would add is just like Bjorn mentioned, you know, you know, strings and choosing a string is more an art than a science. There is the scientific part of it as, you know, when you do string and high attention and you get the smaller sweet spot, but then you do you have to take into consideration, yeah, the type of string you're using, the thickness of the string, how it's strung in the racket as well is important. Some different stringers will have different ways of different methods of stringing the racket. Um, so, yeah, there's so many different factors to consider and it is a very personal and subjective thing. So just like Bjorn just mentioned there, you know, he's string at 32 pounds, I string at 28 pounds and I probably might even use a different string to be on. So it's all, it all comes down to personal preference and what you are capable of certainly and what you're used to as well. So thanks Bjorn. That's cool. Um, and hopefully that answered your question, Naga. And sorry, one other thing is depends on the stringing machine you use. Is it calibrated correctly? Because I've had stringing machines where I've strung it at literally 35 because it's so that the calibration's all wrong and it ends up being about a 28. So it really depends on the stringing machine as well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you have a big difference between manual machines and uh, electronic machines. 
Yes. In terms of vision. Excellent. Look, I think that we have definitely answered that question quite thoroughly. So hopefully that's given you a few things to think about. And for everyone else listening as well, if you do have any stringing questions, do let us know and we will do everything we can do to clear up any areas where you're not clear on, or it's just, there's too much information out there that it's hard to digest at all. So beyond, let's get into where you are now and where you've been. So you've had a rich history in badminton for many, many years, and it's spanned across many continents and you've done great things and met so many people along the way. I'd love just to hear how it all started. You were nine years old, you're in France and you moved to different countries, but I'd love to just hear how you experienced badminton. Okay. So basically, as you mentioned in the, in the introduction, I started when I was uh, nine years old uh, back in France. My father was really, uh, and he still is, quite sporty. So uh, he got me involved into several sports, and uh, not only badminton, but tennis, soccer, as well as uh, a little bit of squash, uh, rugby. And so I started playing all these sports at a young age. And um, badminton was quickly the one where I had the most fun, combined with tennis. And so actually I was playing uh, until the age of uh, 14 years old, both tennis and badminton. And uh, actually at 14 years old is the age where we moved uh, to New Zealand with my parents. And I came uh, at the point, so it was maybe a little a year later, I think I was uh, yeah in 2005, so 15 years old, where I had a coach in tennis that was telling me on one side, if you want to be really good at tennis, you're going to have to stop badminton. And I was uh, receiving the opposite speech from uh, my badminton coach, which uh, you have already interviewed, uh, named TJ Westra. So I had to make a decision at this point, and I think I made the decision, so I already briefly mentioned it, about uh, the pleasure that I got from badminton. I mean, I, I also really enjoyed tennis, but really the feeling that you get on a badminton court for me is the best feeling that I got from sports. And also about the environment. So not only TJ, but we had a, a good quality group back in Waikato at the time. So with uh, Oliver Layden Davis, uh, which you have already uh, interviewed as well, Michael Felk, uh, James Patterson, just to name a few. And so we had really a, a good group going and that really, it's really the people around the sport that uh, made me take this decision. And uh, now that I look back at all that we went through, you know, it's really uh, the most beneficial thing that I got from Edmonton is how many great people uh, you get to meet through the sports and uh, around the world. Yeah, we did have a chat about that before the podcast about being able to connect and reconnect and be grateful for the badminton community that you've established beyond. So going back to when you were 15 and you did have to make that decision between tennis and badminton, like you said that, you know, there's the community, those people around you and badminton really kept you in it. Was there something that differentiated between tennis and badminton for you as the sport itself? I know you enjoyed and then found it more pleasurable to play the sport, but was there something a bit more specific about the sport of badminton that you, you know, decided that that's the one that's going to stick? So I think what really makes the, the beauty of badminton, and I mean, you have, in some way you have this aspect as well in tennis, but I feel even more in badminton is the fact that you can combine touch shots with power. I love, for example, in, uh, in men's singles, you know, for example, going for a spinning net shot to set up a, an attacking shot. So, and the attacking shot can be varied a lot in badminton, right? You can go with the half smash, you can go with the drop shot an attacking clear. And I feel like all these all this variety of shots in badminton makes it really an interesting sport. And when you look at the best players, you know, for example, uh, Lin Dan, Lee Chong Wei, just to name a few, I mean, now they're retired, but these are the players that, which uh, I grew with as I was playing. It just looks so cool when these guys are playing because they can do so many shots from their rackets. Mm, definitely. And I guess that's another reason why Henry and I love the sport as well. There's just so many elements to it, isn't it? It's not just power. It's not just speed. It's not running a hundred meter race, which is very exciting, but it's just about speed and power, right? There's so much skill. There's so much tactics. There's, there's so much involved in badminton. And I guess that just aligns so much with our vision in basically showing the world how incredible it actually is rather than I'm um, sure in New Zealand, maybe not in France so much because I've heard that it is a lot more recognized and understood in France, but especially in New Zealand where people probably didn't even understand what it was or if they did, it was kind of one of the sports that you played at school once a year or twice a year and that was about it. 
Absolutely. No, there's a big difference in badminton culture between uh, New Zealand and France, particularly because, uh, as you mentioned, in New Zealand, you will play it once in a while at school and it's not really well known, you know, seen as a beach sport and so on. I'm guessing it's uh, relatively similar in, uh, in Australia. In France, it's actually part of the educational program for sports. Uh, so you actually have every kid at school playing it. So people just know about it. And we have actually a lot of uh, social players. I think we have about 300,000 members at different clubs in France. So it's really a big community. And uh, I have moved back to France in 2011. And I can tell you that since that time, I can already tell that there's a huge impact in France. And uh, we can see that not only do the top athletes from the country uh, perform better. I mean, for example, players like Brice, I think, have changed the image of, of French badminton throughout the last years. And uh, you can really tell, I would say, the depth of players is getting uh, really quick in France. And maybe this is where countries like New Zealand are, uh, again, I'm putting Australia in the same mix without as much to New Zealand, but like the depth of player is not as interesting compared to France or other European countries, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And I guess that comes down to our, the podcast that, that we did have with Brees. And he talked about how he was not really, he didn't say he was responsible, but I perceived it that way where he was responsible of really growing the sport in that he's grown the belief. So when he goes and beats Chong Wei or, or beats some top players like Targo or uh, he, he's beaten a lot of top players before and it just brings that belief to the system, right? And then once people start believing, then things are possible. And now that the French have so much more depth in them in every event. So in mixed doubles, there's Thomas and... What's his partner's name? Delphine. Yeah, Delphine. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're going fantastic. And he's so young as well. And yeah, there's heaps of things going on. And I actually heard from Brees last time that the amount of players is always growing, but it's actually the amount of courts that's the issue at the moment. Is that right? Uh, so that's, I think, specific for the Paris region. Okay, sure. It's, it's actually a little bit strange because we have a lot of clubs but it's uh, often in uh, omni sports. You have multiple sports uh, covered through halls that are uh, basically managed by the different city halls. And we don't really have any private clubs. And that's really something where there could be a demand actually for a badminton specific kind of structure uh, where people would be able to have access uh, to badminton courts whenever they want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So beyond continuing on with your story, so you're in New Zealand, you moved to France in 2011. Then where did you go from there? Um, well, I'm not sure how much time we have because I've been uh, to a few places. But um, basically, as you mentioned in the introduction, my plan back in 2011, so as you would have uh, guessed, I felt at that point like I wanted to play for New Zealand. I mean, having lived there from 2004 until 2011, really wanted to represent the country. I really felt like a Kiwi, but that, that was not possible because of the dual nationality. And uh, at 2011, uh, I already missed out on the Commonwealth Games, Junior Olympics, also World Junior Championships. And so, you know, the, these key events, which really make you want to train harder and inspire you, I was not able to participate in. So when I was 21, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to have to make a decision here because for me, my biggest dream was to participate in the Olympic Games. And so I just had to find a way at 21, you know, it's like, okay, you're, you're an athlete, the time is now, you know, you, you cannot wait. Uh, obviously it's gonna take a few years. And uh, with uh, the US Federation, I was able to represent them straight away. The negative side, I would say from uh, being in the US uh, Federation is that you don't have a, a national center. It's all uh, private clubs and so on. And uh, it's also one of these sports as for uh, many countries where you don't get so much funding. And so I had to find uh, a way to get some kind of financial support. And this way was to play for a French uh, badminton club. This club was Issy Les Moulineaux, also in the, in the Paris suburbs. And uh, here I was able to train on a daily basis. And uh, here we had really a good group of players, uh, I would say at international level. There was an Indonesian coach at the beginning called uh, Agus Sujimin who also really helped me. And then there was a Bulgarian coach called Mikhail Popov, who is still there right now, actually coaching the Stoeva sisters. So you really have a, this kind of structure in France, club structure, and it's developing more and more. You were touching base on, uh, on how the, the French 
band and Tim culture was getting stronger. You really have a lot of different structures around France now that are getting stronger and stronger. And uh, here I was able to really be part of that in the city Moulino and uh, combine, I would say, this kind of center and travel around the world to try to gather as many uh, world ranking points as possible to try to make it to the Olympics. And so how was that journey beyond for when you did try to get to the Olympics? Like, can you give us a bit more information about your travels around and when, what you learned? Because uh, you've had such a cross-cultural experience, you would have been able to, I guess, develop a lot of insights into different cultures, not only about their badminton, about, but their way of life. So um, what was a little bit unique for me uh, was that I, I was really a kind of a a lone wolf, I would say. I would just, you know, travel around. And uh, so I got actually a little bit closer with the Mexican team. I was able to go over there uh, a few times. And uh, it was actually quite interesting with the Mexican team because we were a few players trying to go for the Olympics. So this was for 2016 for the Rio Olympics. And uh, we were able to really inspire each other. So again, it's uh, players which you have already uh, podcasted. Mariana Ugalde, Lino Munoz. I don't think he's been in the podcast, but Rob Castillo as well. And uh, I was able to kind of get involved in this team because I was playing a lot of uh, South American tournaments for the Rio 2016 uh, journey. So I was able really um, to give something to them uh, because I guess they didn't really have at the beginning, I remember this kind of European way of thinking which is a little bit different uh, compared to because um, they had uh, actually some Asian coaches from Indonesia, from Malaysia, and it's uh, quite different compared to the European way of thinking. So I was able to give them something different. And while they were able to give me, I guess, some kind of team support, and even though I wasn't playing for Mexico, I felt like we were really in it together. So that was really interesting. And uh, obviously on the side, I also had the team support for uh, interclubs with the French uh, Isile Mouillino club. So it was really, I guess, uh, what made uh, my career beneficial was the fact that even though I was traveling by myself, I was able to, to get involved with different teams, uh, whether it's uh, from Mexico, whether it's uh, in the French club. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that comes down to being, say, a smaller country competing on the world circuit, right? And my experience is very similar to yours as we spoke about before we actually started this recording. And that was that the amount of people that you meet. So even if you weren't part of the Mexican team and I had the similar situation with the Americans, the Canadians, like there's so many people out there, especially in the smaller countries where there's only a few players that you get to know so well. And they become basically your teammates because you're traveling around, you're going to all the competitions together. And yes, you might play them. And of course, if you have to play against them, then of course it's everyone for their own, of course. But other than that, they'll train with you. They can help coach your match if they're not playing on the same day or if they've got time. And you do develop these excellent and long-lasting relationships with so many different people. Now, if you were going to look back at that, is that something that you really cherish about your badminton career? Com completely. I would say it's actually uh, the one thing I would uh, cherish uh, the most so as you said at the beginning, this kind of multicultural experience uh, Edmonton has enabled me to travel and uh, really meet very interesting people, very different cultures. And uh, I feel like whenever you meet somebody or whenever you, you're in a different country, there's always something positive to take out of this culture. I mean, uh, going back all the way to, to New Zealand, you know, there is uh, some things which I really treasure in terms of uh, values, in terms of honesty in terms of uh, being humble, you know, it's, it, it's things that are, I really treasure. So uh, with the Mexican culture, I would say it's also a lot about friendship, teamwork and so on. And, uh, and again, touching on the Mexican team, I think that they've done really well in the last couple of years because uh, they also do not have a, a kind of, I would say, a central center or a central team where, where they can really have, I would say, clear objectives and something that is structured. But by being a few players together, they've been able to improve and uh, reach a, a higher ranking and so on. And uh, in France, obviously, uh, the different things. I would say that it's more about the overall level. Uh, again, the depth of players. I mean, you have uh, more players that you, even at national tournaments here in France, I would say you have an international level. Uh, really, uh, for example, the last French tournament I played in, I lost, I think, in the quarterfinals to Christophe Popov, 
I'm not sure if you know, but he's there. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he junior and yeah, very, very strong men's singles player. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he's uh, you. You have to be on the lookout for him, actually. But uh, he, you know, that's the kind of player who you're playing against at a quarterfinal in a national tournament. So it's like that. That's how you improve, right? This uh, this ability to be able to to play different players, different styles, and I guess you just uh, you just learn from this and uh, and get better and better. Now that's excellent. So Bjorn, if we continue with your story then, so qualification towards the 2016 Rio Olympics, where did we leave off? So you're, you're training with the Mexican team, you're traveling with the Mexican team and you were playing a lot of tournaments in the South America area so that you could qualify for the games. Uh, where did that take you? Um, well, it was actually a little bit hard to combine because at the time I was trying to finish my studies and digital, uh, marketing and communications while having, I would say, a dual objective in terms of, uh, of badminton, in terms of sports, which was uh, obviously the Olympic qualification. But as I told you from the beginning, I was financed by the club. I also had some kind of responsibility for interclubs. So uh, being here and, and being able to play, obviously, at my best level whenever I was uh, in France. So um, in terms of where it took me, I think that I became a better player playing these tournaments, playing, you know, obviously during Olympic year, as you would know, you play a lot of tournaments. Uh, I forgot exactly how many I played between 2015 to 2016, but I would say over 20. And the, the I would say the lesson I learned the most is that you're constantly on the road. And so whatever happens, whether it's good, bad, let's say that, for example, you're, you were bringing at the beginning uh, Argentina. So I, we went to, to Argentina, I think it was 2015 when I won the tournament. And then next week you have the next one, right? What they, I forgot what it was, Colombia or Chile. And it doesn't matter whether it's a good result or bad results. You just have to go on next week, new tournaments, different player. You know, maybe you even play the same player as last week, but it's a different match. And you have to win again. And it's just over and over and over. And you just have to be as tough as possible uh, to be as consistent as possible and get the best chance to qualify. Yeah, I can imagine sort of you don't even get any time to debrief. It's just you win, you lose, and then you move on and then you go again, right? And yeah, with the with your journey and progress to um, getting to the Olympics, um, so how close did you get, Bjorn? Uh, I forgot my exact ranking, uh, but basically I was number two uh, for the States and it was only uh, one that could qualify. So it was Howard True that qualified for the Rio 2016 Olympics and I must have been about 80. So um, to, to be honest, I'm not even sure if I had made the cut. I think it's um, 36 or, or 38 players that qualify uh, for the Olympics. It's been a few years now, so I don't really... Uh, <laughs> remember the the exact numbers but yeah so i, I was close but uh you know didn't quite make it but in the end looking back at it now it's not about making it or not making it it's uh, it's really about the journey i mean uh, again uh, all the different people that you meet and it just makes you so much tougher to say you know you've done everything that you can i think uh, i've had some obstacles but anyone has obstacles i mean uh, you look at kento mamota who's currently number one in the world and he's had a, a few obstacles right but he he's just uh, really tough and uh, he's able to become number one after everything that happened. So I think that's what makes the best, the best is how to deal with all the different obstacles and how to find solutions uh, to keep uh, progressing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I can definitely relate with you with regards to that Olympic journey and then just falling short at the very end. It is a bit bittersweet, but there's so many things you look back on. And I've said this so many times on so many different podcasts is that I wouldn't take it away for anything at all. There's no other way that I would have wanted to spend my time during that period when you look back at it, because it's just a phenomenal experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And then I, I really took, I said, maybe to go a little bit further uh, into my career after 2016. It was obviously um, in my mind that 2020 was an option. But really, I had kind of changed uh, attitude and my overall approach because I was thinking, you know, wh whether I had made it to the Olympics in 2016 or not, uh, it's not like I would have been in contention for an Olympic medal and so on. You know, if you play a player like Lindan or not even that good, you know, a top 10, top 15 player, uh, really you stand no chance. I mean, at the level which I was at. So it was really about for me, can I improve? And instead of being, so I think it was 67 in the world, right? My best ranking, can I improve in the next few years and be 
top 50, top 40, top 30 and really go into the Olympics and you feel like you have a chance against any player and really believing in your Olympic tournament and not just being there for being there. And uh, I quickly realized in 2017 uh, that really that was my limit. I felt like I made maybe some small improvements, but um, nothing uh, which really made me think, okay, I can go for Tokyo 2020 and not really in between, you know, that blurry line where you can either make it or not make it and it's 50-50. You know, I didn't want to be in that situation again. So, um, So, yeah. Yep. So from that point, you decided that you would go into your full-time career or job at the moment. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, uh, I was quite lucky in terms of timing because in 2017, so uh, I integrated the company you mentioned, so a company called Atos. So it was just to finish an internship and uh, and get my diploma at the beginning. And then uh, I had an opportunity to uh, integrate, uh, I mean, to to stay in the company for a year uh, on a one-year contract. And then I was able to get a full-time contract in 2019. I really loved uh, this new adventure, you know, and it was uh, and it's actually also related to, to the Olympics. But uh, putting this aside, it was really something new, something where I wanted to fully commit. And so obviously when you fully commit uh, on one side, you have to let go uh, on the other. So for me, it was time to get onto this Atos adventure and uh, put badminton a little bit behind, I guess. Yeah. And now that you've moved on to your your working career, are you still playing much badminton? Yeah, so I'm still playing. So now I have a change club. I'm not playing for uh, Issy Les Moulineaux anymore. I'm playing for a club called uh, boulogne billancourt uh, also in the uh, Paris suburbs and actually really close to Issy Les Moulineaux. And now uh, so playing national interclubs, uh, which are still quite tough matches in France, I would say. Uh, Especially that now we are we will play from September in the first division with uh, this club, so it will be uh, there will be some international level uh, matches. It will be tough because my training regime is not as strict and as uh, regular as it used to be. But now I'm much more in the approach where I want to help the younger players. Uh, so we have actually a young team in this club. Uh, there is. Um, couple of 22 year olds. There is a, a one a woman singles player that's 19. And I'm really looking forward to this, uh, I would say, top level experience in the first division and uh, trying to teach them, trying to make them handle, I guess, mostly losses, to be honest and to be mm-hmm. realistic uh, yeah. during the season, because they will play really top international players. Uh, some of them even top 20, top 30 in the world. But you know, what can they get out of that and for them also to realize what it is to be a top player in the world because that is something where it can be a little bit tough uh, but you also have to realize what it is and then you can analyze what is missing for you to get there yeah and i guess that's such an important transition isn't it that the pathway for french players at the moment is paved really well in that they do get this exposure to these top 20 top 30 players in the world in their home country. And of course, France being close to all the other European countries, it's, it's close to fly around for tournaments. But I guess when you come to the, the U S or Australia or New Zealand, where the, the road isn't really paved for you that well. And what happens is you go play internationally and it is such a huge step. You know, you're not really exposed to that high level at a younger age or, or at a development time. It's kind of when you're there, you're already trying to compete, which is really difficult. So how would you say that, how important would you say it is to have that exposure at that 19, even 20, 21 year old age group is for a person's development? It's really, uh, not only is it important, I mean, it's uh, the priority. And uh, we were talking about the the European system, which is very inter-club based. So we're talking a lot about France, but they also have a very strong uh, league in Denmark uh, and Germany they have a bit of a different system in, um, in the UK, but I mean, there's several countries where they have this type of format and it's regular top level matches. So it's really uh, something that will make you improve instinctively, I would say. But you have a different kind of structure, I would say in Asia, where it's more on the trainings uh, and the different clubs that you will have. So for example, um, in Indonesia, you have a crazy amount of clubs uh, where they produce, uh, I mean, I don't know how many players and they're just competing against each other, training against each other. And that's how they get their exposure, right? And so in Europe, it's in a different way. And all the countries you mentioned, yeah, it's true that 
you don't get this type of exposure and it's something which is hard to get when you don't have the, the structure behind. So I, I would say my best advice is, yeah, try to travel, try to get the best type of environment. And that's really the decision which I took in 2011. I also realized that at that time I was one of the best, if not the best uh, men's singles player in New Zealand. And to get better, I needed to play against better. And so I knew that by going in France, and it was actually really tough because um, I remember in, uh, when I was 21, that's the time when I won uh, my first international open in New Caledonia. I guess I got quite a few good results, I would say, in the Oceania zone. And then I arrived in Europe, and uh, I think my first three or four tournaments, I lost first round to players you know, uh, that, that didn't have such a high ranking. But again, going back to the depth, and it just gives you a kind of realistic view, and it's like, okay, it's not that easy. You just have to be better and you just have to be, and that's something that you need to work on on a daily basis. And it's really good to get that reality check uh, with uh, the French interclubs or the numerous international European tournaments that are here. Yeah, I can imagine that being so strong in Oceania, it's sort of like you reached the top of the mountain, but then you went over to Europe and realized that you've only gone halfway and there was another mountain to climb. So it's definitely yeah, a very unique journey that you, you've gone through. And that kind of process is definitely something that you know we at the Badminton Podcast have heard about and Jeff has experienced and you have experienced. And I would definitely recommend that for players that are in countries that don't have badminton as such a dominant sport. Now, Bjorn, moving on to your new journey of being able to contribute and give back to badminton as well as apply potentially skills that life lessons and skills that you've learned as part of your badminton journey. Are there any, any sort of the things that you were able to transfer to now your working life or even to, I guess, your job as, as a mentor to some of these younger badminton players? Are there any skills that yeah you can think of? So to answer to the first part of your question, uh, so I would say within my uh, current job, when you're a high level athlete and you have high ambitions, you will do whatever it takes, I mean, to reach to that level. Again, if you realize there's some gap uh, between your current level and what you're trying to reach, you will just go on court or you will take your skipping rope or you will do a weight session, you know, but you will work for it because you know deep inside that you need to do it to get to where you want to. And so that's really something I've been able to take into the office uh, now in my in my full-time job. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's 7 p.m., 8 p.m., if there is some kind of project that you need to finish, it needs to be done no matter what, you know? And it's kind of, again, this reality check saying, if this is your goal, you know, do whatever you, you can and what is possible from your end because you're in control of what you're doing, right? Of uh, how much you train, how you train. And so same thing with your projects, lead them. And, and don't put boundaries for yourself. To answer the second part of your question, uh, as a mentor, what is really important from my perspective, and then maybe going back to one of the first questions from this podcast, uh, what do you like so much about badminton? I feel like there's so many different ways to win a badminton match. I see badminton as a, a big puzzle, and you have to collect really as many pieces of the puzzle as possible. So, for example, um, if you're if you're fitter than someone, uh, maybe you can you think that you you'll have a better chance at winning a, a longer match, right? But what happens if the player that is less fit has a better, I would say, shot quality? Then it, it may not necessarily be the fitter player that will win a three set match, right? So, it, it's really interesting because that's really for me what I appreciate a lot about badminton is you can win by being faster, you can win by being fitter, but you can also win by being smarter tactically, or you can also get into the psychological game. So to test the other, I would say mentally, you can be more accurate in terms of shots, you can have more skills. And that's really something I would like to transfer to these younger players is, okay, you, you need a base. Of course, you need to have, again, collect uh, the different puzzles, the different pieces of the puzzle, sorry. But then you have to find a way. And in the end, it comes down to two things. There's two ways, I mean, in, to win a point. Either you put the shuttle on the ground or either you put the shuttle once more above the net. So it's really, you know, either you, you have to go and win the point or either the other one is going to make the mistake before you. And it comes down to really winning matches for me at top level badminton comes down to this. And if you watch any top level player, that's, uh, I think that's how they do it. 
Excellent. Yeah, I've never heard that analogy before, but it is. It is just so many pieces of the puzzle that you need to collect and then join it all together. And the person who can join the pieces the best would probably end up being the winner. So Bjorn, now you've been able to transfer a lot of your skills from that you've learned through badminton and being an athlete into your job. So at the moment now, with your new journey in the marketing, in the communications area, what does that look like for you in terms of your goals? So where are you now? Where do you want to be in terms of your career, in your job, I mean? And how do you think you're going to get there? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. For me, uh, that's the reason why actually I took on this job at the beginning is because it was such a, a good learning experience. It was really, I mean, by the time I was 27, so in 2017, all my life was around badminton. It was about being a top athlete. And all of a sudden I go into an office and you're behind a laptop and you have these digital projects and you have to, uh, you also have group projects and so on. And it was all very new for me. And it was, uh, really something that made me develop personally. Uh, and that's something I think it's still the case right now. I still have a, a lot to learn. And so the next couple of years in this job, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, Atos is, uh, I'm not sure if I told you, but, uh, even though it's on an international scale, it's uh, a French company. And so with the uh, next Summer Olympics, so putting aside Tokyo, which, uh, which has been postponed for next year, uh, there will be Paris 2024. So th that is something I would like to be part of. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Atos is a very interesting company that's into IT services, innovation. And I think it's, um, I, I really like the different topics. And I like also the, the fact, again, going back to what I like so much about badminton, uh, the people that you meet. You know, in, in Atos, you, I've met uh, several engineers, IT experts, innovation experts that are just uh, so interesting to listen to. And it's just so interesting to learn about things which you didn't even realize existed uh, before when I was on a badminton court. It sounds like you've been able to relocate yourself into a similar environment to the, the badminton environment that you were used to. It's just a different arena, but still with very high caliber and very interesting individuals beyond. Absolutely. So there's one question that I'd, I'd like to ask, and this is for professional badminton players or competitive badminton players where they're on that, I guess, that intersection between yeah, going into professional life and whether or not you had any advice for, let's say, specifically professional badminton players that are coming to the end of their badminton careers. Because a lot of the times we speak to you know professional badminton players and they've sort of boxed themselves into you know i'm a professional badminton player what am i afterwards i'm still a professional badminton player and they tie themselves to that and the question i would have is yeah what kind of um, advice you'd have for these players that are looking to set themselves up for success afterwards like you have yourself it's uh, it's a very good question because actually it's something that uh, took a lot of uh, work for me obviously when badminton is all your life, it becomes part of your identity. And so in 2017, when I had to let go of that, it was kind of like a breakup. Uh, really, it's something where, you know, you have your working on it on a daily basis. You love the sport, but sometimes you hate the fact that you have to go run 400 meters on a track. I don't know, but you know, it's really something really similar to a, a long-term relationship. And, uh, and like you say, it's something that you hold on to. But for me, um, the base of my decision was when I analyzed what did I take from Bemington? Okay, so I have all these positive experiences, uh, the travel, uh, meeting different people and so on. But what can Bemington give me uh, at the age when I'm 27, uh, where I feel like I don't have so much more room for improvement. And I see on the side that I have this open door to a whole new world, uh, something where we will meet completely different people with completely different backgrounds. And it's something where I was also able to give uh, something different to this company because it's mostly um, IT engineers or people that don't have this sporting background. So again, going back to uh, my previous badminton experience, I was able to see the positive side of giving something different to this company while they were giving me something new. And that's where I feel it's positive for both sides. So yeah, I mean, it's a tough journey. It's, uh, it takes time. It takes time to really say, okay, um, you know, it's the end of high level badminton. And uh, I'm telling you this, but as I mentioned before, I'm, I've still got one, one foot on the badminton court, right? So it's a long process to let go. But the easiest way I would say 
to get out from it and to completely, I would say, move on is uh, to have a new project, new ambition, something that you really look forward to uh, and that will make you grow personally on another level. Yeah. Excellent advice. Because I guess the reason why badminton players, especially professional badminton players, have that drive and motivation to train hard and compete is that passion, right? It, it is that deeper why as to why they're actually doing it. And I guess the, the way that us badminton players are going to be able to move on per se is to find something that gives us that amount of passion again, whether it's within badminton itself. Of course, there's lots of avenues through badminton that you can make a career, but if it, it is outside that, then finding that deeper reason why you want that other thing and make it compelling enough that you can step away and be really satisfied with the progress you're making towards this new bench or this new goal that you actually have. Absolutely. I completely agree. Cool. So um, Bjorn, we are wrapping up here. So just wanted to see if there were any listeners out there who loved all of your wisdom, but potentially had some questions for you to see whether you could help out with anything, any decisions, any thought processes, et cetera. Would you be open to them to get in contact with you or be able to basically touch base at all? Absolutely. My pleasure. My pleasure. So do you need, for example, my social media accounts or uh, well, I guess you can contact me directly? Yep. Yep. But open to any questions, obviously. Sure. Okay. So what's your social media account? Uh, I guess you can contact me on uh, Twitter is probably the one where I'm uh, most active. So it's uh, at Bjorn Sigwin attached. Yeah, just contact me on there. I guess it would be the easiest one uh, to connect to from a social media perspective. Cool. All right. So we'll put that in the podcast description for all those listeners as well. So now that we're at the end of the podcast, Bjorn, we, Jeff and I just want to thank you again for coming onto the podcast. We've had a really, really good time. Uh, I had a great time as well. And uh, just to capitalize, you know, um, on what I said at the beginning of the podcast, I think it's absolutely great what you guys are doing. So keep going. I will share from my end uh, the different podcasts that, uh, that will come up in the next few weeks, few months. And yeah, keep going. And uh, hopefully uh, it has a positive impact uh, in the whole wide world. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks Bjorn. Bjorn. Now, um, Henry just wanted to ask a question and to see whether you could pronounce volant better than us. Volant. Volant. <laughs> volant. So it's volant. 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 Mm -hmm. volant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> every every time we bring on uh, someone that speaks French, we will ask them to pronounce our brand name for us. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you come up with, uh, with the brand name Volantware? So um, one of the earliest uh, games that are similar to badminton back in France um, was called Jeu de Volant. I don't know if I'm saying it properly. The game of flight um, or the game of shuttlecock. So what we did was we, yeah, we took that last word, volant. And yeah, as you know, in, in France, they call the shuttlecock volant. And it actually aligns with the feeling that Jeff and I both feel when we actually on court playing. So when Jeff had described this once when, you know, when he's feeling in flow on court and he's playing really well, he feels like he's flying and that he has wings. So that's sort of a summary of how we came up uh, with the name Volant there. If there's anything you want to add, Jeff? Yeah, I guess, yeah, not really. It's just that we always wanted it to be tied to badminton. We didn't want just to have a random name that didn't really have much relationship with badminton itself. So when it was all very serendipitous in that we, we found the name or someone helped us find the name and then it meant flight, which is exactly why I, I love badminton is that when you are playing well and everything's going the way you want it to go, it does feel like you're kind of flying around the court and you're, you're basically weightless. Um, not sure if you have that feeling beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's actually one of the best feelings in the world when uh, you feel that nothing can go wrong on the court uh, and that uh, you're moving smoothly, uh, that all your strokes are working. It's, it's uh, really great. I always bring it down to um, the time when, I'm not sure if you've ever felt this before, but the time when you're playing so well that you're serving and it's 20 and you don't want the game to end. You've got match point, but you just don't want it to end because everything just feels so good. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And also because you know it's not going to last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <Exactly>. true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for everyone out there listening, we just want to say thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the Bams Podcast with Bjorn. And once again, from Henry and myself and all the listeners, Bjorn, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your story, and your time with us today. My pleasure, guys. 
So wherever you are in the world and whatever level that you play badminton, do share this with everyone that you know because badminton is a sport for all. It's a sport loved by so many and it is our vision to make sure that our love for the sport is spread across the world so that those who don't know about it can experience the love that we experience on the court as well. As you can probably tell, Jeff and I had a really good time speaking to Bjorn today. So guys, I think it's time to just continue sharing our podcast episodes with everyone just because we're having so much fun here and we just we just want to share that with everyone as well because we're talking about the sport that we love and hopefully if you're listening and you, you're not a badminton player, you just stumbled upon us that you can get involved in the sport too. And if you do want to connect with us, you can connect with us via Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn and TikTok via our social media handle Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. And don't forget to check out and shop at www.volantware.com. Feel free to reach out to us and ask any questions just like Naga did uh, earlier today um, and request any topics for any episodes. We're here to serve you guys and we're here to just show the world how incredible our sport is. So we will continue to do that and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bjorn. Bye-bye. This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.